practice planning. And uh, but before we do, this morning I want you to to get woken up a little bit. So what I'd like you to do is just uh, stand up and find a partner and face them. Okay, we're just going to do a little little activity to get you moving here. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do some punch blocking. Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, boom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One hand up and the other. <laughs> okay. Now, just get your uh, mental acuity going here. You're going to face each other and you're just going to count to three back and forth. So, the first person is going to say one, second person is going to say two, the first person will say three. And then the second person will say one. So we're just going to keep going one, two, three, back and forth, okay? So go ahead. Uh, little faster, a little faster. <laughs> okay, that's good. Now, instead of one, instead of one, you're going to snap your fingers. So it'll be... Two, three, two, three. Okay. <laughs> okay, hang on. Now, instead of two, it's going to be a clap. So, three. Three. Okay. Okay, now, now for the grand finale, it's Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now, final thing, find another partner and do that. Do it with a different person. Okay, that's good, that's good. <clears throat> okay, have a seat. Okay, so now that has nothing to do with practice planning, <laughs> just trying to, to get going, but maybe it does, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to do in this session is try to get you thinking about, like the practice planning is, is great and, um, you know, what goes into a practice, but we're going to do that in other sessions, but we want to think a little bit about just what we're trying to do with this uh, practice planning. So. So I guess the question is, why are we practice playing? So just fill in the blank. Practice makes per what? Perfect. Well, that's wrong. You're wrong. Yeah, okay. Practice does make per something. What would be, what would be more accurate? Permanent. Practice makes permanent, right? So perfect practice makes perfect. Okay, perfect practice makes perfect. So that's one thing that we want to think about, is we can practice things and practice and practice, and it'll make them permanent, but we want to try to do things perfectly as if we can. 
Now, the other thing, we'd like to add a couple more P's to this, is planned, purposeful, perfect practice makes perfect. So think about that. So when we're going into practice planning, we want to think about, we can have perfect practice, and that's great, but so what? So we need a plan, right? We need a plan for the season where we're going, but we need a plan for that practice where we're going, and we need a purpose. What's the purpose of our, our practice? So, so we want to add those two P's. So plan, purposeful, perfect practice makes perfect. And that might be something that we would aim towards. And we want a sense of direction. So this is another important thing. So if, if you don't know what's important, then everything is important. So when we do coaching clinics and we say, OK, we've got all of these things in volleyball to think about. OK, we've got you know passing and serving and and spiking and blocking and, and digging and all that sort of thing. That's great, but depending on the level you're at, what is really important? So if we have, if everything is important, uh, when everything is important, then you have to do everything. And, you know, because that's the way it is. Well, it's important, so we have to do it. But when you have to do everything, you don't have time to think about what is really important. So one of the things we'd like you to do, depending on what level you're at, what part of the season you're at, is think about what's really important right now and focus on that. Otherwise, we get distracted doing things that aren't really important. So we have to figure that out is when, for the season, where are we going, what's important at each part of the season. So that's a pretty important one. Okay. <clears throat> So a few things in practice planning is we want to match up the level uh, of play with the point in the LTAD. Just to, to get a, what level are you guys at? How many people would be doing, um, say, 13 and 14 U? OK, and 15 and 16 U, and 17, 18? So we've got a pretty good mix here. So there's going to be different objectives at the different levels of play, right? And, and we want to make sure that at 13 and 14U that we're not doing things that are more appropriate for the 17 and 18U. And I guess vice versa, you know, we, we want to be, make sure that we're at the right level of play. So in terms of seasonal planning, uh, we need to think Here's the parts of the season. So we've got the early season where we're, we're just getting going, general preparation phase. And these are, are terms that you hear in NCCP. When you're doing the NCCP, you'll hear these terms. We have the mid-season, the specific preparation phase, and the late season, the competition uh, preparation phase. So I think, uh, now Jim, Jim, when you assigned they're assigned for different parts of the season, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I left, uh, they had a method drill, and then they were selecting the season that they wanted to choose, to choose that part. Like yeah, that yeah, yeah, so, that yeah, so this is stuff that you really have to do. Now, planning is, is like, it's so important, right, is at the start of the year, before it even starts, you have to do some planning so you know where you're going. And planning, pretty interesting. Um, a number of years ago, I, I knew a couple of guys that took over the U of A basketball program. And they hadn't, you know, they were coming in as new coaches. They spent three 40 hour weeks during the summer, solid 40 hours a week planning the season. Now, they're post secondary coaches and they're getting paid to do that, but a lot of planning goes into it. And, you know, you think about um, even, you know, a lot of post-secondary coaches uh, will spend up to two hours for every hour of practice. Like, that's incredible. I don't know, who, you know, they have to be full-time coaches to have that time. And, but we get a lot of coaches that on the way to practice are figuring, oh, what are we doing today, right? So that little bit of planning, we really want to encourage you to do planning coming into this so that, that you really know where you're going with it. And it depends where you're at uh, with these 
parts of the of this. Now, <clears throat> another thing that we'd like you to think about is that there's four areas usually in the planning. And I'm sure this isn't new to, to anyone, but the way we want to think about this is that we've got the technical planning. So technical would be doing things like developing skills, right? So that's skill development, the technical part. We've got the tactical part. So that's team play and working with others. So what sort of systems are we, are we using? What sort of plays are we running? So if we're, <coughs> we're running a, a certain play, that would be tactics. If we're doing some sort of defensive alignment, that's tactics, right? And we also hear that referred to as strategy. So tactics or strategy. We have the physical part. The physical part is dealing with the development of the athletic abilities, so the strength and conditioning, flexibility, all those sorts of things. And then we've got the mental part, so the mental or psychological. So how do those all fit together? So when you're planning a season and or planning a practice, these are all components of it, right? And when we look at that general preparation phase, that at the start of the season, these are some suggestions, and you might or might not agree with this, but this is a starting point, is that early on, the technical and tactical are going to be a big part of what we're doing, right? And the physical as well. The mental, and this is something you got to think about, where do you throw in the mental part, the mental preparation? Because it's pretty... When you, when you ask people about the mental, they say, like most coaches and athletes will say, when it all comes down to it, what percentage would you say is, is mental? When it all comes down to the final, like a lot. You know, you, some people say 90% of it is mental because we can all prepare physically and technically and tactically, but when it comes down to actually performing and enjoying it, most of it, is the mental or the psychological. And, you know, you talk to pro athletes to write all the way down, they'll agree with that. And yet, we spend very little time, very little time on the, the mental, right? We, usually it's just an add-on. We'll do, <coughs> let's do our mental skills session this week or this month. And do we integrate that into practice? So you gotta think about how you might, how you might do that. So as we move through the different periods, we see the technical is going to come down a little bit. The tactical is going to go up. The physical is staying fairly constant, and the mental is going up a bit. So you've got to think about that a little bit um, as you're preparing for your practice. Now, anybody have any comments on these percentages? Or are we missing anything, or do you agree or disagree? Right. <laughs> okay, so, but, but it's something to think about. So you have to, to really think about how you're going to put these things into to practice. Now, just let me ask you, in a, in a practice, if you're doing a practice, how would you incorporate the physical with the technical? Do you, should they be separate or do you, put them, do you put them together? Can you develop physical as you're doing technical? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so that would be preferable, right, is to, if we can combine them and not just, let's not just run lines over here that really doesn't have much to do with volleyball. Let's not run lines. Let's do something where we're developing the physical as we're working on technical development or tactical development. That can be, you know, that can be uh, pretty strenuous as well. So think about how we can, can get these things in there. Okay, now, here's the, the key thing <coughs> that I hope that you would take away from our little session this morning. This, I think, is what practice is all about. It's about transfer. So transfer means that why else would we be practicing if we weren't going to transfer this to a competition situation? So we can come in and have a great practice, but if it doesn't relate and transfer 
to the game situation, then we might question what we're doing. So the whole thing is transfer. How can we set up practice so that whatever we do in practice is going to carry us into the competition situation? Okay, so that, that's, I think that's a big theme here that we'd like to, to think about today. So how can you transfer what we do in practice to the, the match situation? Okay, so that's going to lead us to a little bit of motor learning. And open versus closed skills. So just talk to the person beside you. I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of talking to the person beside you. What do you think is the difference between an open skill and a closed skill? Just discuss that with the person beside you. If you have any idea, what's an open versus a closed skill? <laughs> Okay, hang on. Can anybody, uh, does anybody want to tell us what's the difference between an open and a closed skill? Uh, we were thinking that a closed skill is more like a specific, um, it's more impacting or setting, whereas an open skill is more of a gameplay and team-like skill. Okay, well, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Can anybody, yeah? Yeah, okay, and, and I think that's even more on track. So what we're talking about, open versus closed skills, is the, what we call the stability of the environment. And I think that's what you were getting at, is so how stable is the environment? So a basketball free throw would be a pretty stable environment, right? You're, I mean, there's nobody guarding you, the basket is fixed, you're at the free throw line, and the only people distracting you are people under the basket waving at you and trying to distract you, right? But you're pretty well under control of everything. So that's it's a very stable environment. But in volleyball, if you're, um, going, if you're a, 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 an attacker and you're going up to spike, well, the ball is coming, you know, it depends on where the serve is, where the pass is, where the setter is where the setter sets the ball, where's the defense, the blockers, there's a lot of, it's a very unstable environment. There's a lot of variations, right? So we have, that's a very open skill. In volleyball, serving would be more towards the closed end, right? Because you have more control. Now there's still some variables there. And so it's a continuum. It's a continuum from a closed to open. What would be an example of, of a skill you can think in a sport that's really closed, that there's no variation? Can you think? Darts. Okay, yeah, so darts. It's right there, except when you're doing it in a pub. And it's <laughs> 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 the only place I've played. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, but darts, something like that, it's very, very controlled, and there's nothing really, you know, to, to bother you. And so we think about that. Now that has a huge implication in how we practice. So think about um, gymnastics practice, which would be pretty closed skills, right? When you're doing a routine, a floor routine, you're gonna do one skill, then another, and another. And, but there's no variation. You're gonna do it the same every time. Every time it's gonna be the same. But in volleyball, that hardly ever happens. Like things are always different. You know, the ball's coming differently, you're a different spot in the floor, your targets are different. So that's gonna influence the way we set up practice, whether it's an open versus a closed skill. So let's keep that in mind as we, as we go through some of these other terms. 
as we go through some of the other terms. Okay, so <coughs> masked versus distributed practice. Okay, so now masked versus distributed. Masked practice would be if you came into the gym and said, okay, we're going to do 50 forearm passes. It's mass, okay? We're doing a whole bunch of them at once. Massed practice. Distributed practice would be, well, we're going to do 10 and then take a break. Then we'll do another 10, take a break. So we're going to split it up. Massed versus distributed practice, okay? Now, what do you think would be more effective in learning? Distribute it, probably distribute it. Mass, why, you know, mass has its advantages, but why, why would distribute it be more advantageous than mass? More similar to the game, yeah. And maybe fatigue would be another thing. Yeah, yeah, with the coach. Now, one thing we want to think about is that when we're learning skills, when we're learning skills, we learn motor patterns. Right? We, so, so when I'm learning to pass, my brain is working with my body and giving us a motor pattern. It's developing something in there that, so okay, now it's time to pass. It sort of pulls out that motor pattern and I'm going to do my pass. Right? So every time in a situation that I'm doing that, it's going to pull it out to, here's my motor pattern. And that's great if it's the same place on the floor every time with the same speed of the ball coming at me, same traje trajectory, then I can really work on that time after time after time. But the problem is, in a game situation, it's different every time, right? So mass might be good in initial stages, you know, maybe not 50, maybe it's 20 in a row as you're trying to get that form, but we probably want to break it up, distribute it, and give our brains a chance to pull out that motor pattern, right? So staying with that theme, we go to constant versus variable practice. <clears throat> now, here's the difference in constant versus variable. This is sort of the next step. So constant practice would be if I'm right here on the floor and and Julie's my target, and the coach is, is tossing me the ball, boom, every time, constant. Okay, variable is here one time, now I've got to move over here, now I've got to move up here, okay, so that's variable practice. So we're mixing it up, constant versus variable. Now, when you're first learning, maybe constant is okay, right, to get the idea, but as we progress, we want to mix it up. We want to make it variable because it is variable in our sport of volleyball for most of the skills, right? They're more towards the open end. Okay, so constant versus variable. <clears throat> now the, the next one is blocked versus random practice. Okay, so Talk to the person beside you. What do you think would be the difference between blocked versus random practice? Random sort of an interesting term. What do you think? What's the difference between blocked and random? Okay, so anybody, anybody have an idea? What would be the difference in blocked versus random practice? Who's want to give that a shot? Yeah. I'll take a shot. We think blocked incorporates open mass constant, 
where random is the closed distributed variable all combined into one. Yeah, okay, not quite, but <laughs> good. But that's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I think that's the, uh, the idea. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's what you guys were saying or not. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, but that, that's the idea is that block practice, it's sort of like mass, right? Is that, that block practice, you'll work on one skill all the time. Now, to give you an example, um, so when I go golfing in the summer, that seems so far away right now, and um, but when we go golfing, go to the driving range before, and I get my five iron, and I'm hitting five irons. And after about four or five of them, you know, you get loosened up, and they start one after the other. Well, sometimes <laughs> they, they they're going out there nicely where you want it to go, right? And so what's happening there is that I'm pulling out that motor pattern that we talked about, and after four or five. I don't even have to think about it much anymore because it, it's there. I just keep doing it. And then I'll, so you know, I'll block, that's blocked with my five iron. And then I'll hit some with the driver. And same thing, after a few, I get that motor pattern and boom, they start going well. Now, I go to the, <laughs> the first tee and, you know, maybe the drive's okay. And I pull out my five iron and I don't hit it that well. But it was hitting like 15 minutes ago on the range. It was great. So what happened besides lack of talent? What, what, what's the explanation for that? The environment has changed. The environment has changed. And when I hit on the, on the range and I hit that first five iron, probably wasn't the greatest. You know, I had to warm up and pull it out. And, and you know, so it was there. But when I play golf, I don't hit... 25 five irons in a row, you know, you hit a driver and a five iron and a, a wedge and then you've got a putt and then you come back. So you're mixing it up all the time, right? So each time you've got to pull out that motor pattern and, and work on that. So when we do blocked practice, it can have its purpose, right? It can have its purpose. But volleyball is a game of open skills random in a way and so when we're setting up practice you got to think about how are we going to set up our practice so that we're not just doing one thing all the time but can we mix it up so really what we're talking about here is how can we make it game like how can we make it game like because what we're doing remember our our goal is transfer so how can we make our practices more game like now, it depends on what stage we're at, okay? But think about that. So even when we come in for a warm-up in volleyball, what would, what would a typical warm-up be? What do people do in a typical warm-up? What's that? Laps. Yeah, do some laps and, yeah. Yeah, do some laps around. Let's do a little stretching. Uh, you know, then maybe play a little pepper and that sort of thing. Now, let's ask, so laps, stretching, pepper, are those things game-like? No. Laps aren't game-like. We don't do laps in the game, although, you know, you need to warm up somehow. Uh, stretching, we don't usually stretch during the game. Do we play pepper in the game? No. In fact, there's some, you know, in volleyball circles, some people wonder whether pepper as we usually know it, it, what the value is, because it isn't that game-like, right? There's no net there. We're not in relation to the court as we would be. So now people are advocating when we come in, well, let's just do some, like, let's play a, a little game at the net, you know, inside the attack lines. We'll just warm up by playing back and forth uh, over the net or maybe with a partner, low-level activity. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to do a little setting. We're going to have to 
to pass a little bit. Uh, maybe hit it some sort of roll shot over the net. Depends what level you're at. That'd be hard with 13 year olds, right? But you can adapt it. And so make it volleyball like, okay? And plus, it's random. Okay, we're doing one skill, then another, then another. Now, what's the, what's the drawback of that when we get, when we are in practice and we're doing random skills versus blocked? As a coach, what's the problem with that? Technique. Yeah. Yeah, so as a coach, you've got to rem remember what is the purpose, what are we doing, and your feedback is given to that and not worry about the other stuff very much. And also the performance sometimes isn't as good, right? We get way better performance if we just do, you know, 20 in a row. Oh, yeah, after 10, we're just bang on, right? Versus doing two and then doing something else and coming back and doing two more and whatever you know, however we, we structure that, the performance isn't as good. But although the performance might not be as good, what's happening? Learning. Learning is happening, right? And that's where we, that's as coaches, where we have to get past that point of, I mean, we want to see performance, but how does it transfer? So it might not look as good in practice, but hopefully eventually in the game, it's going to look a lot better because we practice randomly and mix it up a little bit and that sort of thing. So, so those are some considerations that we've got to think about. They're pretty important to, for us to, to think about as we're planning practice. Now one final thing we don't have on here, <coughs> but talk to your partner about this. What do you think is better? Do you think that... Uh, we have different ways of, of learning. Um, we've got learning by progression. So if we were teaching an attack, you know, first of all, we're going to work on the approach, and then we're going to work on the jump, and, and then the contact, and then we're going to put it all together, so we're going to have a progression. Or you just show some people hitting, get your players out there, let's go and hit. Let's see, you know, it's called whole learning, right? What do you think? What do you think? Which is best? Talk to your partner about that. Is there one way that's better than the other? Okay, that's, uh, that's good. <clears throat> any, any thoughts on that? What do you, is there a, a best way of, of doing that? Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right. So it depends, right? It depends. If a, a player can pick up the whole skill right away, fantastic. Some kids can do that. They just see it. They model it. That's the way we learn. That's, most of our learning comes from modeling, right? It's uh, from...
copying, imitating. That's why, you know, it's so nice for a sport like uh, basketball. It's on TV all the time with the, the pros and college and that. Kids can just watch and then they go out and practice. And volleyball is a bit more of a challenge because we don't see as much on TV. So hopefully as coaches, you'll get your players to college games or university games where they can see that and model it. They just sort of absorb it. But if they can learn by the whole method, fantastic. But usually we've got to use some sort of progression, right? We've got to progress and take them through. But another thing to think about, right, is, you know, if you've got a kid that can do it right away, well, maybe we should just let them do it and, uh, and try that. So, <clears throat> so we've got all these things to think about, but our bottom line is, how does it, how does it transfer? How do these things transfer to a game situation? Okay, now, <clears throat> next thing is stages of learning. It's like a motor learning class. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole college course in, in uh, half an hour this morning, so it's great. So stages of learning. And <clears throat> so we have the acquisition stage, where the introduction of new techniques and tactics. And sometimes we call this the getting the idea stage or the verbal cognitive stage. So if you're coaching, you've got a group of you know, kids that are just coming in to volleyball, this is just the getting the idea. Let's you know, teach some of this stuff and they'll have to maybe talk themselves through it and they've got to think about it as they go through. So that's like the first stage, that acquisition. Now the stabilization is when you've got increasing technical proficiency and players will be able to give themselves feedback. Okay, well I know what I did wrong that time. In the first stage, people have no idea what they did right or wrong. They have to learn what it feels like and what it looks like, right? So <clears throat> this is the next stage is um, stabilization. And, and then the next stage is integration employing techniques, tactics, or decision-making in game-like situations. So, uh, last night, Jim talked about method one, method two, method three drills, right? And that might be new terminology to most people, and, and even for those of us that have been in volleyball for a long time, that's the way they've categorized it is somewhat new, but really what they're talking about is, what are the stages of learning? Right? And how do we apply our coaching to those stages? So, and the challenge, <laughs> real challenge that we have as coaches is you've got a bunch of kids coming in and they might be at different stages, right? And you're one coach with 12 or 13 or 14 kids and what do you do? You know, so that's a big challenge. So when you're planning your practice, you've got to take this into consideration. Yeah. Um, assuming we're mid-season, let's say, how would you recommend going about teaching the self-identification of helping, like for example, my setter, if she sets the ball and it goes over the net, you know, at the beginning of the season, encouraging them and teaching them and, and showing them a lot of technique and the mechanics of their skill set, and then how do you, um, I have a couple of ideas, but I want to get more ideas about how to help them self-identify what went incorrect. Okay, well one thing that comes to mind right away is that we've got way better technology now, right? So in practice, bringing in some sort of video. You know, there's, there's lots of, um, I don't know whether anyone is using it, but there's lots of coaching sort of packages for, for analysis, or even from an iPad you can do some filming. And then show them. And show them. And, uh, and I know, like all the way through all the levels, people are using that. But even at the post-secondary levels, they'll have that set up and people can do some skills and then they can, they can actually, they're at the level where they can just go and take a look for a, a second, how did that look? And then come back and try it again. So I think using technology, if we, you know, if you have time to explore that, that can be really good. You know, if you've got other coaches, that helps if you have other coaches, uh, and that's a big problem. So, 
but probably the technology. Okay. So the the practice itself, practice itself has these parts. This is pretty standard, right? If introduction, warm up, main part, cool down, and debrief. And <clears throat> this is taken right from the manual that you have, your um, development coach manual. And so just a, a couple things here. So the warm up, how do we get a good start when people first come in? So one thing that you might consider then, if we're trying to make this game like, is trying to come up with exercises that are related to volleyball. They're not just the jogging around the track, doing some stretching. Now, a great source, great source, um, I don't have this on the slide, but is a, a guy in the US, his name is John Kessel, write this down, K-E-S-S-E-L, -S -S -E John Kessel. And we've had him at symposiums before, and we'll probably bring him back some, maybe next year, maybe the year after. And, um, and he's great with this sort of stuff. He's a, an expert in volleyball, but he, he talks to all sports in the US and around the world. And, but if you go Google him, find his website, and he's got all sorts of ideas for this. Yeah. Sorry, did you say John or Jeff? John. No. No. Okay, sorry. Well, maybe there is a Jeff Kessel, but this is John, yeah. And it's not Phil that plays for the, the Penguins either. So, so, so yeah, so it's uh, John Kessel, great source of ideas if you're looking for that. Yeah. I think it's also John Kessel that's created some apps for the iPad for what maybe you might be looking for as well. Oh, okay. There's like a slow-mo and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I think I was just looking that up at Christmas, and I noticed his name attached to those apps. So. Yeah, so she's saying that, that there might be some apps available from him as well. He's just, like, he's, he's just really good at applying all of these ideas. And uh, he's played at a high level, and, and, uh, but he also still coaches a 13U team using these principles, right? And so then the other thing is that we can use the warm-up to focus people for their, for the practice. So, you know, there's different ideas about warm-up, but just think of how much better our practices could be if our players are focused right from the start. So maybe there's something that you can do to help with their focus. You know, maybe there's some sort of little gathering you have or a pre-brief about practice, about what we're going to do, you know, how we're going to do it, and we get them thinking about what they want to achieve that day in practice. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but let's get them from their everyday life thinking about this. Okay, the warm-up, just a couple of ideas there. We want to raise the body temperature, and we can do that through these low-level volleyball activities. We want to get some stretching in there, but once again, we can do that. Although some people would recommend doing some volleyball activities and then maybe taking two or three minutes to do a little bit of stretching just to make sure that we're, we're stretched out. I think a lot of people have heard there's still, the jury is still out about stretching versus injury prevention. When they do studies, it's about the same number of people get injured that stretch and don't stretch. There's no scientific evidence of that, but we know that it feels better, and intuitively we know that it feels like it would help prevent injury, but it also might be a time where we get more focused, right? And we want to make it volleyball specific during that warm-up. Okay, the main part of the practice, um, we want to think how are we going to integrate the technical, tactical, the physical, and the mental. So that's sort of part of the bigger plan, but each practice we have to think about that. And then things that, that I think Jim probably talked about this a little bit last night. Hey, and, and so we've got what's the drill structure? We're going to do drills. What length of drills? What order? Uh, what's the objective of the drill? We need an objective. 
What are the conditions that we're running it under? What are the variations of the drill? One of the cool things about volleyball and probably any sport is that at the start of the season, we can start with a really basic drill. And as the season goes on, we just keep adding to it. So by the end of the season, we're doing a drill that started on the first day that was really basic, but we've kept adding and adding. We had more variations, more people, more objectives, and, uh, and away we go. So it's, I think that's a really cool part of, of coaching. What's the success criteria? What makes a successful drill? And what are our reference points? And I think, so as you're building your drill for presentation tomorrow for the people that are in the, the um, NCCP training, these are things that you, you'll be thinking about with your, with your partner. Okay, the cool down, we want a lower body temperature and maybe do a little more stretching. So even in the cool down, we want to keep it as, as volleyball specific as we can, right? As volleyball specific as we can. And a little more stretching to, to prevent soreness the next day. And finally, the last part of practice is a debrief, which you might or might not have. You've got to think whether you're going to have this every day. Most coaches now do some sort of debrief at the end. Do you do it every time? Well, I think a lot of people do. Just bring people in and, and talk about these things. So what happened in practice? What did we do? Well, so what? <laughs> Big deal. So what? And now what? Where are we going from here? So a good practice to get into is the debrief at the end. And what, so what, and now what? Doesn't have to be long. And actually after competitions too, after a lot of games, you're going to do this as well, right? As some sort of debrief. OK, so the bottom line, does my practice transfer to competition? That's really the bottom line. You know, if we're, if we're just doing perfect practice, that's great, but we want planned, purposeful, perfect practice to take it from practice to the game situation. And, uh, and we, you know, that's our big goal here, is how do we do that? And some of those things we talked about, block versus random, the type, you know, those type of things are going to help us uh, with that. Okay.